Okay, I think I'll, I'll make a start. Um, you're all very welcome here today to this Bioform we uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Kathleen O'Hagan. I'm a, a global change facilitator in Bioform and I'll be hosting the webinar today. Um, so the webinar title is Current Approaches and Considerations for Viral Clearance in Cell and Gene Therapy. Before I start, I do just want to give a quick introduction um, to, to Bioform and, and who we are and what we do. I appreciate um, a lot of the, the, the audience members may be already members of Bioform, for, for, but for those guys who aren't, um, I'm just going to take a minute, very quick a minute to, to go through um, sort of our, our main aim and goals. So essentially Bioform is a global collaboration. Uh, so we bring together experts in the field, experts like you guys, uh, to come together, collaborate and share problems and challenges. And the goal is to create, uh, I suppose, best practices and um, procedures that allow um, you guys to, to solve these problems. Um, in Bioform, we have what we call 11 forums or working groups, um, which are sort of focused uh, topic discussions. You see, we have the cell and gene therapy at the top. We've got the development group, drug substance, fill finish, for example. Um, these, the, the rest, the rest of the 10 forums all focus in on general biologics. So. How cell and gene therapy form is different is we cover from development straight through to commercialization, but within the cell and gene therapy space. Uh, and within the, the, the cell and gene therapy forum, we have 38 member companies and, and over 850 active participants, uh, some of which you'll be hearing from uh, today. Uh, and we've two levels of, of what we call work streams or, or teams. So the first level, is, is what we call our, our high level work streams. Uh, these are large teams that meet intermittently, typically sort of every two months. Um, and they come together to sort of for a quick topic discussion um, in, in topics associated with the industry. You'll see here that we have um, modality focused and functional focused teams. And then the second level of uh, work streams or teams that we have are what we call our in-depth or, or deep dive work streams. Uh, and these teams are focused on specific topics, what working towards a sort of defined deliverable. And it's from one of these deep dive teams that you'll hear from today. So the cell and gene therapy, um, for the viral clearance cell, sorry, the cell and gene therapy viral clearance team recently produced a publication entitled Current Approaches and Considerations for Viral Clearance and Cell and Gene Therapy. Um, for those of you guys who haven't accessed this, I encourage you to, to do so. Um, it, it's been very well received. We, you know, a high number of downloads and some great uh, feedback on this publication. I see one of my colleagues has just dropped a link into the chat. Um, and this work was a result of 17 organisations coming together. Uh, we had a number of what we called core authors who, who significantly contributed to the publication and then a number of contributing authors. So I'd just like to take some time to thank everyone that contributed to this great work. And it's this work that you'll hear about today. We're very lucky to have three of the key authors on the call today to, to talk us through and showcase the, the, the presentation. Um, I'm just going to pass over to each of these guys now to give themselves a quick introduction, if that's OK. Marion, would you like to start? Sure. So, uh, hello. I'm uh, Dr. Marion McKee. I am Vice President of Biosafety Testing here at Eurofins Biopharma Product Testing, uh, located, located at our flagship site in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, in the Biosafety Division, I have the Viral Clearance Team, uh, some of which I see are on the call today. Uh, and this is something which we have all been really looking at and starting to address. So we're excited to be able to, to talk with you today. Great. Uh, is Kathy? Is Kathy Kathy's here. Hello, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Remington. I'm. Um, I work for um, Merck KGAA um, called. Um, we go by Millipore Sigma in North America. Um, I'm a technical consultant for our group that supports clients from a technical and regulatory perspective. My background is viral clearance. Um, for many years, it was traditional biologics, um, and now we're including um, uh, um, gene therapy factors. Kathy, and then finally, last but not least, Dan. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Dan Herwitt. I work out um, for BMS in Seattle, Washington. 
Um, I wear a few different hats, but primarily um, I lead our AV platform development team uh, in support of our um, cell therapies. And I have been working with AV since about 2017. So yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks guys. Um, just to say there will be opportunities for, for questions um, at, at the end of the presentation. We'd encourage you, if questions come up during the presentation, we encourage you absolutely drop those into the chat and we will pick up at the end. Um, but please, we're, we're, we've allowed sufficient time for, for questions, so do ask those questions. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to pass over then to our first presenter, Marion, who, who's going to start with, with the scope and introduction. Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. So I'm just going to give you kind of a brief overview of where we're going. Um, so today the talk is going to address how the gene therapy industry can leverage the best practices from the biologics and cover some of the unique considerations for AAV products. Uh, one thing that the team found in our just conversations is that we've learned a lot with biologics in the last 40 years, but there are some unique considerations when we start to talk about gene therapy products. So we're going to give a quick overview of the regulatory landscape, talk a little bit about the sources of viral entry, and then Kathy will take over with phase appropriate considerations and some of the key aspects to consider when designing a viral clearance study. And then Dan's going to take us through several case studies for viral clearance for AAV product. And then we also are going to share the results from an industry survey that was conducted uh, by the BioForum sort of see where our industry partners and fellow industry uh, participants are with regards to viral clearance for gene therapy products. So talking about the regulatory landscape, I think everyone who's done anything in viral clearance knows that the ICHQ5A has globally been long considered the reference, uh, reference guidance when designing a viral clearance validation strategy. Late last year, a the draft of Rev2 or revision two of the ICHQ5A came out. It was much anticipated in the cell and gene therapy realm because it was published um, and it recognizes the unique nature of these cell and gene therapy products. Uh, this new revision, which has been out for comment uh, and we expect it to be finalized, I think late this year, it also covers the genetically engineered viral vectors as well as the viral vectored products. Now, today we're going to talk more about the viral vectors and concentrate on AAV, but the new Rev also talks about um, other viral vectored products as well. And it, it talks about those steps for viral clearance that don't negatively impact the product. Um, it, when it comes to the reduction factors, it encourages a risk-based approach when determining what the log logarithmic reduction factor should be for the step and overall for the product. Again, recognizing the unique nature of these products. And it emphasizes that studies also demonstrate the ability of the uh, to clear any of the impurities from the manufacturing process, taking into consideration that many of these viral vectors require helper viruses or unique systems in order to manufacture them. For, for ultimately therapeutic use. And it also provides some mitigation strategies. Uh, in addition to the ICHQ5, Q5A, um, other regulatory guidance exists from the FDA and EMA and some of the other worldwide um, medicinal product uh, agencies. And the pharmacopeia also provides some specific guidance and outline quality requirements for gene therapies. One thing I forgot to mention about the ICHQ5A that we also wanted to note here, and I'll touch on in the next slide as well, is that it also promotes the use of many molecular methods, including next-gen sequencing, and that's more extensively discussed in this Rev2 as an option for characterizing and also biosafety testing and analysis of these gene therapy and cell therapy products, again, which are not necessarily um, able to be tested by some of the traditional means. Okay. So this just really kind of talks a little bit about the sources of viral entry. If you, you think about it, there are three pillars for, for biosafety and viral safety that include sourcing of the material, testing of the material, and demonstrating that you can clear any contaminants through the, the process that might be in the material. So a critical piece of this is identifying 
risk assessing and addressing any sources of potential viral contaminants or entry of viruses in the manufacturing process. So some of those um, opportunities for viral entry into the process are shown in this pie diagram to the left on this particular slide. And as you can see, there are many possible sources of viral entry from the raw materials, the cell banks that are, are required in order for, to, for the production, as well as, as I mentioned before, in some cases, the helper viruses that might be uh, in the process all the way through the operator's environment and the process itself. So the approaches to address these particular risks include material sourcing, following the good manufacturing processes under a robust quality system, documentation, environmental monitoring, and testing. And again, when it comes to testing, I'll mention that there is the traditional viral safety testing, uh, much of which is an in vitro test followed by multiple endpoints, but in the, 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 the recently revised regular uh, guidance from the ICH, there's also quite a bit of mention and discussion of using molecular methods, whether it's targeted PCRs for known viruses or next generation sequencing in order to do the viral testing and to determine if there are contaminants within these viral-based and cell-based gene therapy products. I'll now turn it over to Kathy. Hi. Um, it's important to understand when we're thinking about viral clearance studies that ICHQ5A um, is talking about um, commercial submissions. So um, when you are um, performing a, a clearance study to support um, a BLA um, or a marketing authorization, some things to remember about this. In the, the ICHQ5A, it mentions that any viruses actually used in the production, be it a helper virus or um, um, a baculovirus that's used for an AAV expression system, those need to be considered in the viral clearance study because they're, they're actually part of the process and you need to demonstrate that you can remove them. If there's any known or likely um, potential contaminant that needs to be um, used or modeled in the viral clearance study. And then also we need to include um, viruses that are nonspecific models that will represent certain characteristics of, of a virus. So things like um, a DNA virus, an RNA virus, an envelope virus, non-envelope virus, um, ones that are large, ones that are small. So that that you can demonstrate that your process is robust and can has the potential to remove or inactivate a, a variety of viruses. How much clearance do you need? Well, um, it's not exactly spelled out for um, non-enveloped um, viral vectors. Clearly, if you have a virus involved in the process, um, you need to remove all of it and then um, includes some excess clearance as well. If we think about um, um, the CHO cells, which have been long used and many clearance studies done, the retroviral-like particles are a process contaminant. And we typically use um, a, a retrovirus XMULV as a model for that. And um, it's typically been expected that you have four to six logs excess clearance um, for your process. So that, that might be kind of a gauge or a model to consider consider when you're thinking about um, viruses that are part of your process. Non-specific model viruses, again, these are just demonstrating the robustness of your process. There's not a specific level of clearance that's required. Um, one thing to remember is that for an AAV process, um, the, the clearance may not be as, as, as much as you would see in, for example, a monoclonal antibody process. There may not be as many steps. And so if your clearance is limited, then you need to fall back and rely on your um, 
on the testing piece to make sure that the, the testing of your raw materials going into the process and maybe in process testing is is very um, well thought out and and um, robust. Um, for um, an envelope viral vector for which you cannot do viral clearance studies, that is um, how the the viral safe the, the viral safety relies only on that. Um, and um, finally, for a clearance study for an AAV vector, there are um, a lot of things that we need to do that we would do in, in a clearance study for any particular um, product. So we would want to look at the distribution of virus in various fractions, chromatography, we need to evaluate um, the ability to sanitize that resin. And if you're going to be using that resin multiple, multiple times, we need to assess um, the aged resin. Uh, the, the clearance with aged resin. Now for an early phase submission, remember that there is no guidance document that currently um, talks about that. Um, our suggestion is to discuss that with regulators. Clearly you're going to need to be um, evaluating any viruses that are considered a process impurity, um, any uh, known or likely contaminant, but um, beyond that I, th I think you um, are recommendation would be to discuss that with a regulator. The next slide. Um, here are some examples of the a virus panel that um, um, could be used for um, an AAV. Now remember that um, there are many ways to produce AAV and each will carry a different um, risk. So if you have a helper virus, um, either um, an herpes um, simplex um, helpers virus or an adenovirus, you're going to want to include um, that helper virus in your clearance panel. And then you'll want to include some other nonspecific model viruses that are going to show um, the robustness of your process. So these viruses would represent a range of characteristics. Um, we will want to have um, three to four viruses um, to, to, sh to show um, the robustness of the process. Um, again, for a baccalovirus, clearly we're going to want to include that virus as a process impurity. Um, and um, a, a model for the insect rhabdovirus that has often um, been associated with the F SF9 cells um, that um, support the growth of baccalovirus. Uh, typically, a mammalian rhabdovirus such as vesicular stomatitis virus is used. And um, for a, um, a plasmid transfection system, um, again, there's not a, a, a virus used in the process. Um, if it's um, the process is animal origin free. The risk may be relatively low compared to other processes. And so you may, um, you would include um, just some nonspecific model viruses that represent a range of characteristics. Next slide. So the methods for endpoint detection for a clearance study, um, they um, should always be validated methods. Um, the endpoint um, um, assay should have sufficient sensitivity and reproducibility to, to support studies like this. And we need to remember that infectivity assays are always the gold standard for um, endpoint detection because it's an infectious virus that is really the, the concern. However, with, with justification for certain removal steps, um, a qPCR assay um, or a similar type assay could be used. Um, and now um, Dan is going to talk about some specific examples. Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, so now that Marianne and Kathy have provided a uh, pretty good, you know, background and context on the the what and the why. Um, I'm just going to touch really briefly on the how. I've got three slides um, that just show some of the more common modes of viral clearance. 
Um, so the first slide covers viral inactivation. Um, this is really talking about kind of rendering uh, a virus incapable of an infection event. So uh, the virus itself or components of it may still be present, but it's no longer able to infect. And that's kind of, in this case, the primary concern. Um, and this is typically done through some sort of uh, physiochemical disruption. Um, the three most common ways to do this are with detergent, with um, low pH exposure, or with heat uh, incubation. And this table just lists a couple of sort of typical conditions, um, but they definitely vary widely. Um, and um, uh, for instance, with uh, detergent, um, uh, you might commonly see Triton or, or a replacement like tween, um, but uh, the literature shares uh, anywhere from, you know, half a percent to, to 2 percent, let's say, weight per volume as an example. So um, if you go into the white paper, this is uh, there's uh, quite a bit more detail about this. Um, but as as an overview, so detergent, very common. Um, this is essentially a mechanism of disrupting the phospholipid lipid envelope and thus really only applicable to envelope viruses. Um, and when designing these um, uh, unit operations, you want to consider the concentration, the pH of your solution, ionic strength, um, time temperature mixing, sort of all thermodynamic components of a, a detergent interacting with your virus. Um, but what's great about AAV is that AAV itself is a quite robust virus and it is uh, tends to be um, resistant to detergent and also it's quite commonly um, detergent is used to, to lyse um, uh, AV. So that's that's a great example. And um, again, in the paper, uh, no data shown here, but um, uh, log removal values can range anywhere from like greater than four, five, six, seven LRV across the range of envelope viruses. Um, another uh, approach is low pH exposure. Um, this is very typical in the MAB field, and um, the ranges for pH uh, vary sort of anywhere from two to four, often in that uh, three, three, five range. Again, this is about uh, destabilizing and denaturing um, uh, the, the um, virus, again, typically, most typically for um, envelope viruses. Um, a, a really important consideration here would be the stability of your AAV um, and kind of uh, what, what's happening, whether it's going through um, any sort of viral life cycle or um, whether you might see aggregation. Um, not all serotypes are gonna necessarily be stable at the relevant pH. Um, and similarly to detergent, you want to consider um, essentially like the, the solution and solvent kinetics. Um, the last bit um, is heat incubation. Um, and so I, I have here just kind of typical 50 to 60 C. Uh, again, this kind of varies very widely based on the virus you're trying to clear. Um, and again, it's a it's a denaturation approach. Um, and um, Again, just want to highlight and kind of underscore the importance of considering capsid stability. So on the on the bottom here, we've just got kind of four graphs and they're quite small. And again, um, the references are there as well as in the paper. Um, but just to sort of underscore some of the key considerations, the left um, most uh, figure is uh, differential scanning fluor uh, fluorimetry data uh, for a number of different serotypes. And uh, on the X axis, you've got um, temperature and it's just to show that different serotypes have different um, melting temperatures, different stability. And so if you're doing heat, uh, you really need to think about, um, you know, your specific serotype. Uh, the next figure over is also related to heat. Um, y axis is normalized tighter, X axis is time, and then the different curves represent temperature. And this is for add five inactivation. And that's just to sort of suggest that this is a time and temperature um, uh, process. And uh, you need to consider both. Um, the third figure, um, this shows uh, four different AAV serotypes at different combinations of pH and temperature. And and again, it's it's um uh it's showing this the, the essentially the stability of AAV. And it's just this is quite important to consider. You know, AAV just uh, is is a virus, but really for any you know product where you're doing viral clearance, you need to consider the stability. Um, and the last piece is detergent um, kinetics. So you've got time on the X axis and log removal on the Y. And again, it's just showing um, that uh, the uh, clearance process for detergents is kinetic. And um, typically in a viral clearance study, you'd want to take a couple different points just to show um, uh, just to show that process over time. So you can go to the next slide, Kathy. 
Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so the sort of second um, big bucket mode of clearance is viral separation. Um, there are two kind of primary ways to separate. We'll talk first about chromatography. Um, generally, chromatography leverages differences in binding affinities between um, the product and the adventitious agent. And there are many, many chemistries out there to do this. In, in uh, AV manufacturing processes, there's often two different types of chromatography, um, affinity, um, capture, uh, or some type of capture, and then um, some type of polish, often a X. And this table basically just shows um, that there are a range of um, viruses that can uh, achieve um, considerable or significant clearance um, through those uh, modes of chromatography mentioned. Um, and there's a pretty good reason, um, as can like as can be seen, why uh, Chrome is responsible for at least uh, fifty percent of all um, uh, VC claims. And um, this is there's greater detail in the paper talking about things like scale down model um, uh, development, um, resin reuse. Um, but the kind of takeaway here is that um, Chrome is something that can be typically reached for 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 viral clearance and it's quite effective um and let's see you can go ahead to the final slide so the second typical separation um technology is nanofiltration or, or virus or tendon filtration um and this is again a um a physical separation so like with chrome um, you're you're not necessarily in, inactivating um, uh, or disrupting the virus. You're you're physically removing it from your your product stream or vice versa. Um, and so this leverages size differences. So this table on the right, again, kind of hard to see, um, but uh, shows that there are a lot of different um, nanofilters out there, a lot of different VRF technologies. Um, they were typically designed for kind of like blood products in the MAB field. Um, so MAB filters that tend to be um, smaller, a lot of them tend to actually be focused on parvovirus retention. So AV is a parvovirus. So if you were to use a 20 nanometer filter, you might find that you lose all of your AV. Um, but there are still a number of filters that are uh, quite relevant for AV. These tend to be the larger pore filters um, that were either designed as um, for like blood products or for pre-filtration before 20 nanometer. Um, and so um, this table on the left shows um, just a selection of data from the two most common filters, um, the Planova 35N and Millipore's NFR, which is uh, expected to be around like 50 nanometers. Um, this is a great unit operation. It's really simple. It's very common. And as can be seen, um, you can get a, a quite, quite robust clearance um, for larger, medium to larger size viruses. Um, and um, again, there's uh, qu quite a bit of detail in the paper um, sort of talking about how you might go about um, designing your studies. So that is it for um, this sort of very high level um, quick review of technical uh, clearance approaches. And uh, at this point, I think we'll conclude. So Kath, if you want to go to the next slide. Can you, can you see that, Dan? Is it up? Yep. Yeah, it was a little was slow for me. Thanks, Kathleen. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so what we talked about here basically um, is that if you're manufacturing recombinant and associated virus, you got to have a viral clearance strategy. It needs to be considered. Um, also for other non-envelope vectors, which we haven't really talked a, a ton about, but um, you know these new guidelines and just in general um, make it clear that you have to have some sort of strategy. Um, if your strategy is to do viral clearance studies, um, you can definitely leverage some some best practices from biologics and pull from some technical approaches. Um, but obviously, this is going to be um, kind of unique based on your program's uh, specific needs and considerations, whether it's the viral panel, the unit operations that you're that you're going to reach for, the clearance that you um, have, you know, risk assessed and determined. Um, that that you need to to show, um, but what's great is though these um, approaches may vary, um, the the clearance of adventitious agents in in uh, AV manufacturing is technically very very approachable, um, and it's 
AAV is very amenable to a number of robust uh, viral clearance strategies. So um, about a year ago, uh, we sent out a survey in Bioform just to kind of get take a temperature um, of the sort of participating companies and then a few others um, on what people are doing here. And so not everybody answered every question, but um, we kind of grabbed three three unique bullet points that I think are interesting. Um, for one question, we asked, you know, are you doing viral clearance studies for your first in human programs? There were 18 respondents and half of them said yes. Um, they didn't indicate, you know, whether they were doing triple transfection or helper virus, but um, about half were doing FIH studies. Um, we asked, are you using validated or non-validated scale down models? And um, the majority indicated non-validated. Um, and then um, we asked about pivotal phase viral clearance studies, and we asked 17 folks and, and six indicated that they are. And now it's, it's not clear whether um, it meant that, uh, you know, 11 indicated that they aren't or that just there are only six that were kind of currently in the process. Um, but either way, you can kind of see that there's a, a mix of strategies and different approaches are possible. There's not necessarily a one size fits all approach. So because of that, because of that evolving landscape, you know, that's that's why um, you know, we have this this group. That's why we put out this paper, have this webinar. Um, and we expect that this is just going to continue to evolving and um, and we'll continue to uh, sort of, you know, discuss um, and um, and see our strategies um, evolve.